into our lecture on chapter 9. Uh, and um, chapter 9 is a chapter that if you look at this graphic organizer in front of you, um, the main point of the chapter is really seen right here. Um, let me choose my writing. It's right here. Um, the, it's the Ascension, Pentecost, and the Assumption of Mary. And these are all signs of Christ's triumph. This is going to be the main focus of our lecture today, and it's the main focus of chapter 9. Now, as we proceed in the PowerPoint, Jesus goes up to heaven. Jesus' return to his Father in heaven is known as the Ascension. Ascension. And as it says here, uh, the risen Lord spent 40 days with the disciples after his resurrection, and then he ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of his father. So what we see is those 40 days he spent with the disciples, we studied that in the last chapter. He um, appeared to them, he ate with them, he also did some things that we wouldn't think a person would be able to do, like walk through walls, but he spent 40 days with them, and then he returns to his father in heaven. And this is described um, in Luke's gospel, and um, in the gospel of Luke, also, uh, I like the description in Acts of the Apostles. If you um, open Acts of the Apostles and turn to the first chapter, it says that Jesus um, spoke with them, told them to spread the news. Then he rose up into heaven um, with the clouds. And as the disciples were looking at him and looking into the sky and watching him raise up, two men appeared to them and said, Why are you looking in the sky? And the two men instruct them to continue to spread the G word of Jesus here on earth. And I thought that that was a really um, interesting description in Acts. Because in Acts the Apostles, they, um, the angels tell us not to be looking up in the sky for God, but to be looking here on earth. Because the kingdom of God is on earth. And if you look in your book on page 174, uh, this is what your book says about the connection between Acts of the Apostles and the Kingdom of God. Um, reading for 174, it says, Jesus' ascension inaugurated the new creation, which is also called the Kingdom or Reign of God, since Christ in heaven reigns over all of it. As Christ the Lord reigns in heaven, his disciples on earth work to bring about the fullness of his reign on earth until he returns again in glory. We continue to follow him who is the way, the truth, and the life as we face trials and challenges of our lives. To continue Jesus' work of bringing about God's reign, Christ sends the Holy Spirit to empower us to live our Christian identity and fulfill our vocation or mission as God has given us. So that quote from your book connects from what I was describing in Acts of the Apostles because the idea is, see the disciples here, we should not be looking up here, we should be looking down here. Because when Jesus returns, he's going to return here to earth, to his kingdom. And we need to be building it while he's gone. Now, um, I want to highlight right here a very important aspect of the ascension. It says here that he went to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. Um, this is very important. That phrase, right hand of the Father, tells us something about who Jesus is. Now, you have to imagine in the very early church even as early as just the very disciples watching the ascension here. So we have the disciples watching the ascension. After Jesus returns to heaven, what were they left to think? Who was Jesus? Because they knew him as a human being. But the fact that he goes to sit at the right hand of his father is significant. It shows, first of all, that Jesus is equal to God. Equal to God. So, um, and... Along with this idea of being equal to God, it also proves Jesus is God himself and that he is equal to God. So for those of us living in the light of the resurrection, this doesn't really surprise us. We've always been taught this and know this. But in the early days of the church, people didn't understand the relationship between Jesus and his father. But the ascension is a very important part of the Paschal Mystery because it, his ascending and returning to heaven and sitting at the right hand of God to rule over heaven and earth shows that he's equal to God and, in fact, the same as God. And um, the fact that he ascends and sits at the right hand of the Father is going to be um, very important to our later understanding of the, the nature of the Trinity. 
So we're going to look at some of the heresies coming up in, in our next um, textbook and um, look at some of the heresies and how they misunderstood Jesus. But it's important to point out here that um, this idea of him reigning over heaven and earth um, shows that he is equal to God the Father. Another thing that your book pointed out, let me look up here what page it was on. Excuse me. Um, another interesting thing your book pointed out was the idea that Jesus' ascension to heaven is intimately created, connected to his death. And your book pointed out that we often experience the exercise of power with the use of force. But Jesus had to die to rise to his kingship. So he had to die in order to um, get his power. And so we he see here that Jesus' power isn't um, gained by a use of force or violence. It was gained by his humble submission to death on a cross. And so Jesus is modeling for us sort of a nonviolent resistance. And um, your book says um, on page 178, instead of fighting Violence with violence, Jesus exercised true power by submitting to death on the cross. Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension reveal that true power is exercised in acts of love and not hate, of peace and not violence, of truth and not deceit and falsehood, of serving rather than being served. And that came to us from page 179 of your book. So the ascension is, a, is ultimately a sign of Jesus' power. But that power could only come from his ultimate time of most weakness. And so um, I thought it was interesting that your book put, pointed that out. Now, as it says here, uh, Jesus promised that he would send the Holy Spirit to empower us to continue to witness the gospel. And that's what um, the Feast of Pentecost is about. Now, as we go to this page about Pentecost, I'm not going to go into too much detail now. Because our, um, as we pick up the second semester textbook, uh, after we take your unit test, um, and the unit test dates are posted on Moodle, we are going to pick up where we're leaving off here with Pentecost. So I don't want to go into too much detail. But um, before Jesus left, he promised he would send them um, the Holy Spirit, or in John's Gospel, it's called the Advocate. Advocate. Um, to help guide them and spread the Gospel. And so on Pentecost, and if um, the ascension is 40 days after the resurrection, Pentecost is 50 days after Easter. So it's 50 days after Easter. This is the, when we celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. On Pentecost, Jesus fulfills the promise to send the Holy Spirit. Now, in you see this stained glass window here. You see a dove, and then you see... These little tongues of fire. I don't know if you could see me highlighting these. Let me see if I could change the color. See this? Maybe the blue. See those little tongues? There we go. See the little tongues of fire? So in the gospel, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, strike that. In Acts of the Apostles, um, in chapter 2, that's where you see Pentecost described. And again, we're going to go into a little more detail next, next um, in, in the next few days. But uh, in this picture, you see this dove here. There is no dove in Acts of the Apostles. Um, that actually comes to us from uh, the baptism of Jesus. So the dove is at the baptism, but in Acts of the Apostles, what happens is they are all gathered to celebrate the Jewish feast of Shavuot. And Shavuot celebrated the um, giving of the Torah to Moses, which basically is the birthday of Judaism because the law is what makes um, the Jewish people, God's people. So you see um, all the disciples here gathered to celebrate the Jewish feast of Shavuot. And um, at that time, they hear a strong driving wind and the tongues of fire um, come in upon their heads. And then they all have the ability to speak in tongues. They are speaking in foreign languages that they didn't really know. And so these are all symbols in Acts of the Apostles of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was promised by Jesus um, before he ascended into heaven and also at the Last Supper in John's Gospel. He promises the Advocate will come. And so that's when the Spirit comes upon the church. And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is what gives us the determination, the support, the passion to continue to proclaim the Gospel 
and the spread the good note good news of Jesus resurrection. And so for that reason, Pentecost is called the birthday of the church. And um, Pentecost is also, for those of you who are preparing for your confirmation, connected with confirmation because it's the outpouring of the Spirit upon the church. And your confirmation is going to be the um, renewal of the Spirit for you guys. We just celebrated the Feast of the Baptism of the Lord this Sunday, and you all have the Holy Spirit but confirmation, if you if the Holy Spirit is this little flame inside your heart, so you all got this little flame at your baptism, your confirmation is going to be like throwing lighter fluid on this flame. So it's going to go even higher. And so we often associate these symbols here for the Holy Spirit also with confirmation. And so when you get confirmed, it's going to be sort of like your Pentecost day. You're going to be have the Spirit showered upon you and poured upon you so that you can continue to live your faith. Now, I don't want to say anything else uh, more about Pentecost right now, because we're going to study more about the, the gifts of the Spirit next chapter and how um, Pentecost Day um, becomes the formation of um, Christ's church. Uh, coming up in our, our next two chapters in the, in the next textbook. So, um, finally, we have uh, the teachings on Mary. The textbook talks about a couple of the Mary's teachings that are connected with Jesus' ascension. And so, first of all, we have here the idea that Mary was free from sin from birth. And the idea that Mary was free from sin from birth, that teaching is called the Immaculate Conception. Immaculate Conception. Now... Every once in a while, you'll have someone mistakenly think that the Immaculate Conception refers to Jesus' birth. It doesn't refer to Jesus' birth. It refers to Mary's birth. One clue to us that's referring to Jesus and not Mary are the M's. The M's stand for Mary. Immaculate Conception is the idea that Mary was born free from sin. And, um, you know, obviously the sin you're born with is original sin. So Mary is born free from original sin, and part of the reason why this is necessary is because Jesus is also born free from original sin. And since the idea of original sin is that it's passed from our first parents, um, Adam and Eve, and passed then on to each generation, Mary too is born free from original sin, um, because obviously Jesus couldn't get original sin from his father because his father is God, and nor can he get it from Mary because Mary is born free from original sin as well. And... Um, the uh, this is also a feast in the church, the Immaculate Conception. Um, if I'm remembering correctly off the top of my head, I don't have my notes at home with me right now. It's August 15th, I believe. Um, now, Mary received unique blessings from God because of her special role in salvation history. And one of those unique blessings is described here in this bullet. Uh, Mary's body did not decay at her death as the body of every human person does from the moment of the uh, from the moment of the end of her life on earth mary lived in glory body and soul in the presence of god so her body was assumed and taken up to heaven so this teaching is called the assumption of mary so we had the ascension of jesus and we have the oh that doesn't look quite right let me fix that uh, we have the ascension of Jesus and the assumption of Mary. Now, again, you see the M here. That shows you that this is a teaching about Mary. The assumption is different from the ascension because Jesus ascends to heaven out of his own power, whereas Mary is assumed into heaven or taken to heaven because of her special relationship with Jesus. Mary is special because, one, she was very close to Jesus, uh, she was free from original sin. And also she's free from all personal sin. Free from all personal sin. And that was her own choice. She had free will. She could have sinned, but she chose to uh, refrain from all personal sin. So because of that, because of Mary's unique role in salvation history, Salvation history. Uh, H-I-S-T-O-R. Oh, that looks terrible. Let me fix that for you. H-I-S-T-O-R. 
because of her unique role in salvation history, she is given this gift of the assumption. And this is a dogma of the Catholic Church. Now, um, dogmas are teachings of the church that are considered um, uh, obligations for all the faithful to believe. We have doctrine. And we have dogma. Doctrines merely refer to church teachings, and the teaching voice of the church that gives us our doctrines is the magisterium. Magisterium. Whoops, there's no either. Ma M A magisterium. So the magisterium is the teaching voice of the church, and it's made of both the pope and his bishops. A lot of people think that the the Catholic Church is um, only taught by the, the, the supreme leader of the Catholic Church, the Pope is the only teacher. But that's not true. Um, the Pope always teaches in concert with his brother bishops. So the magisterium, the teaching voice of the church, um, gives us our doctrine. Um, but dogma is special. All dogmas are doctrines, but not all doctrines are dogmas. Dogmas are unique. Dogmas are things, teachings, that all Catholics are obliged to believe. And one of the dogmas of the church is this teaching of the Assumption of Mary. As a matter of fact, these Marian teachings were some of the first teachings to be called infallible by the church. At um, Vatican I, if I'm not mistaken, the church um, declared this infallible. And this is one of the very first infallible teachings. When the Pope wants to make sure that we understand a teaching is infallible, he will say so. And he'll say this teaching is from the chair of Peter. And that is a way of him telling us it's infallible. Now, what's kind of interesting about infallible teachings is that it's very rarely used. And it can only be used in term teachings that have to do with morals or church doctrine. And um, since the term infallible uh, from the chair of Peter was very first used in, in, uh, in terms of these teachings about Mary, um, in theologians began to wonder, well, what are all the infallible teachings? And they actually disagree, since no popes ever used that terminology before that time, um, before Vatican I, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, they disagree on what exactly are all the infallible teachings of the church. Indeed, if you were to ask Google, what are all the dogmas of the church, you'd get different lists. But the most important thing to know here, um, just to review, is that um, Mary was free from sin from the time of birth, and she is the Immaculate Conception. And because of this, she was uh, assumed into heaven. The teaching is known as the Assumption of Mary, and um, her body did not decay. Because that decay of the body at, at death is a, a, um, a consequence of original sin, so she does not have to suffer that consequence. And you see here in this picture her crowned Queen of Heaven. That's one of the titles for Mary. She is truly the Queen of of heaven and earth because of what she gave us, the precious gift of her son. And we as Catholics feel very strongly that we have to give her special veneration and honor because if it were not for Mary, we would not know the love of Christ. Um, her bravery, her faith, um, her purity, and her chastity is something that we can all aspire to. So that is basically chapter 9 in a nutshell. Um, what I want you guys to do now is you need to go to the uh, highlighted section on Moodle and you need to find um, the essential question and you need to write an essential question for this unit. So um, I don't have a new slide here. What you're going to do is, uh, like I said, go to the highlighted section on Moodle and you're going to look for that essential question area. And if I could just make some more space for myself. Um, it's in the highlighted section, and the essential question needs to be on Unit 3. And if you'll recall, Unit 3 was about, Chapter 7 was the death of Jesus. Chapter 8 was the resurrection. Chapter 9, we just did, was the Pentecost, the Ascension, and the Assumption. And then finally, we had 13, which was on the afterlife. So thinking about all those chapters, what would you say is a good essential question. Remember, essential questions should be broad, they should relate to real life, and um, they should have more than one answer. So please post an essential question on Moodle after viewing this lecture. It's very important that you do because I'm gonna choose one of those, two, well, 
two essential questions for your test. 